Happy Friday. It's time for the Richard Skipper Friday Wrap-Up Show. Who and what are you celebrating today? Richard Skipper believes every day is worth celebrating. But today, we wrap up the week with a dose of positivity. You never know who might show up or what might happen. So get ready. Your Skipper is now coming on board and we are ready to set sail. All aboard. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to my wrap-up show. This is going to be my final wrap-up show, at least for the next couple of weeks, because I am going to Provincetown. I leave next Thursday, and I will be there until the 13th. Uh, I'm doing my show on the 5th, so if any of you have friends in uh, Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts, Boston, anywhere in the surrounding areas, please, please, please send them my way. Uh, this will be the first time that I have performed in Provincetown uh, in 10 years. It's also the first time that I am appearing in Provincetown where I'm not wearing a dress. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I've worn many dresses in Provincetown. Uh, but I am so excited to be going back there. Uh, it's one of my favorite places on earth. And actually in my show, I talk about the first time that I ended up in Provincetown. That was in 1987. Uh, I was just a kid. At least I felt I was. And I landed in Provincetown right in the middle of Carnival. And it was truly one of the magic, most magical places I had ever been to. There were rainbow flags everywhere. There used to be uh, a restaurant called Cafe Blase. It's now called The Patio. But at that time, it had these huge uh, multicolored Japanese lanterns. And so it was all colors everywhere. But what I love the most uh, beyond the scenic uh, atmosphere that's there is going to a different show every single night. Uh, Jimmy James, the first time I ever saw Jimmy James, was in Provincetown. There was a great entertainer by the name of Randy Allen who used to do a show called P.S. Betty Davis. The P.S. stood for post-stroke. He was brilliant. Um, he also was fighting uh, AIDS uh, at the time. He unfortunately lost the battle, uh, but it was about the ravages of a stroke or what happens and how that takes over. Uh, it was just an incredible show, but each and every night I went to see a different show. And going to all these shows, I kept thinking, someday I want to be here. And uh, come see the show to find out what happened my opening night in uh, Provincetown, because it was quite an adventure. But enough about me and Provincetown. I have two incredible people here today, and the possibility of a mystery guest, if he's able to make it on time. Uh, but the show Hello, Dolly, uh, those of you who know me know how it resonates so deeply with me. And both of my guests today have a connection between me and Dolly Levi. It was actually Dolly Levi that brought us together. And I'm gonna begin by bringing on my first guest. Uh, this is Thomas Netter. And uh, Thomas invited me up to do a talk back uh, with his theater. And uh, we're gonna talk all about that in a few moments. But Thomas, I wanna ask you who or what are you celebrating today? And I think you've got something very big to celebrate. I do have something very big to celebrate, but um, anytime that something exciting like this happens, first of all, I should say, thank you for having me. And I am celebrating you, our love for Hello Dolly, your love for theater and positivity. Um, and I always, whenever something big and exciting happens, I celebrate my teachers and my family and my support system friends who have all gotten me there. Um, but yeah, I am celebrating. I just got the news this morning that we could share that we are uh, a show that I did at New York Theater Festival in the uh, in December is transferring off Broadway. The title of the show is Holy Rollers. Oh, look at that graphics and everything. Yes. And um, it's got a great, great, funny score written by Michael Janiver and Brian Sweeney. And it's funny and well-written and heartwarming. And I, I like to describe it. It's as if um, the Book of Mormon and Nonsense had a baby. <laughs> I love that. It's so what theater, are you, what theater are you going to be doing it at? We're at the Players Theater in Manhattan for five weeks. 
Well, I want to ask you, I mean, we talked about Dolly and, you know, and uh, we did this great talk back. Here I am with you and Dolly Levi herself. That was such a fun day. And oh, and you've got a Richard Skipper Celebrates mug. I sure do. Um, I love that. So when, um, first of all, I mean, the work that you do at this theater, I remember getting out of the car and I said to Danny, my husband, I said, I feel like I'm home because this theater reminded me so much of the summer stock theaters where I got my start. Many of those theaters don't even exist anymore. And then I was shocked to find out that your theater is not that old, but it was designed to look like an old fashioned summer stock theater. Where did the brainchild for that come about? Um, so Sam Scripps uh, donated the money for the theater. It used to be in a giant tent. There's a grand lawn out in front of the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck. Um, and it was just a giant tent. And Sam Scripps came along and with the artistic directors and, and founders, they decided that they should build a true theater. And at, I mean, it is still a state of the art theater with a full fly system, full tech, um, classrooms and studios for rehearsals and um that's where the orchestra normally goes um offices a full scenic shop flat storage prop storage a huge costume collection um it's just it's blossomed they actually just celebrated 25 years in that building uh just two weeks ago we had a huge gala and they were doing a production of the prom and uh everybody got dressed up in their prom best to come it was it was a great evening celebrating all that that theater has done. And like you said, it's just been home for me. Uh, I did my first show there in 2006. I was Winthrop in The Music Man. And I did Oliver and I did theater there growing up. I took classes there and uh, had some wonderful mentors uh, at the center. And, you know, it's home. And so I'm just, I'm happy that when I get to go back and play, it is like, it's coming home. Where do you think for you, I mean, this love of theater, I know where it began for me, and I talk about that in my own show, but where did it all happen for you as, as a kid, and what was it that pulled you into this theater business? Um, actually, so my grandmother, who just passed away last year, she was kind of, I, I, I chalk it up to her. My, my parents were great about it too, but we shared the real love of the old movie musicals. And so Singing in the Rain and White Christmas and Summer Stock and I mean, The Wizard of Oz, of course, so many of them. She really was the person, as the king and I, we used to, I mean, she used to pick me up and dance me around the living room at three years old and go, shall we dance? And I would go, bum, bum, bum. So it was just, it was always a part of my life like I don't remember a time where I wasn't infatuated with it and she was the one that put me in tap class bought me my first set of tap shoes um and I performed at the Dutchess County Fair singing in the rain I had a little lisp at the time and uh it was like my that was it I mean I I knew I could I could remember and then um, I ended up doing a local high school was doing Peter Pan and they needed a little boy to play Michael so I got to go on stage and fly. Oh, and I was just over the moon. And you're still, you're still feeling, and you're about to open off Broadway. So congratulations on that. I'm getting a little bit of a feedback just to let you know through, through your microphone. So okay. uh, it's like almost like air is going through or everything. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I want to bring on our next guest because she also shares this enthusiasm uh, for the theater. It's still there. Um, and I want to talk about something that we did earlier this week as well. Uh, but I first met her through Frank Anzalone uh, a few years ago when I was, when I first started working on my Call on Dolly site, I got the opportunity to interview her. Uh, and uh, so I reached out to Deborah and I asked her uh, to come on the show. Uh, here she is. And then we ran into each other the other night, speaking of musical theater at Leroy Ream's phenomenal show uh, at 54 Below. Deborah, welcome to the show. Uh, meet uh, Thomas and... Uh, it's so good to hear your love of the theater and how it might have started at a county fair. That's right. <laughs> Anything's <laughs> possible. It's time of year for that. And so you Deborah, where did it come for you? Well, you know, I, I when he said county fair, ding, ling, ling, ling. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota, so I know a lot about cattle calls, but not singing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So uh, I would go like, come boss, come boss, and I could I could really get a crowd but I really hadn't seen any live musicals. So I watched them on TV 
It would be very, very hot. We're talking the Great Plains. We're talking in the middle of 240 acres. Work, 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 work. But there was this one time where we would be in front of the TV and we'd laugh, 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 laugh. And I said, wherever that sound is coming from, that's where I want to go. So I followed the electrical high lines all the way to New York. But um, it was at the McLeod County Fair and I was asked to interview 4-Hers on their projects. And people are very proud of their entomology project and their clothing project. And I was an interviewer when I was 12. And I was, uh, I got a, a purple ribbon on my photography. And I like to photograph events. Fast forward to maybe 2001. And one of the people that I photographed for a friend of mine was Richard Skipper, because he was doing his show um, on Carol Channing. And he was raising money because of all the events that had happened in um, 2001, etc. And that's how I first met him. And the reason that last night, or Leroy's, I knew Leroy because the very first musical I ever saw on Broad the Broadway was No No Nanette. And in that show, I met a man by the name of Ron Schwinn. And I saw him like, the girls were tapping on beach balls. I mean, come on, there was Ruby Keeler and all the... Uh, uh, wonderful, Jane Withers, uh, uh, all these fabulous people. Well, fast forward 1979, I went on tour with Annie and Ron Schwinn was in that show. And Ron Schwinn and I became friends for the last 42 years. And he directed my show, um, Unsinkable Women. Um, and he left Annie to, he said, well, Gower Champion wants me to be in... Um, 42nd Street. And this is my show, Unsinkable Women. And what uh, he he put it together. And um, so there's a connection between Leroy Reams was in 42nd Street with Ron for six years. He was my very dear friend. And about a year ago, but um boom, he had a heart attack and he made his exit. And I was feeling very sad. And, and um, Leroy understands when a partner dies or passes away because he was with his partner for 50 years. And um, so we started to talk. I said, my sister's here to help me do some things. Can you, can you tell us, can we have breakfast and you, can you tell us what you remember of Ron when he did 42nd Street with you? And he basically said, oh, Deborah Jean, he was always in the dressing room playing Scrabble with a Jerry Orbach. <laughs> That's what he was doing. I mean, they had a lot more in common than the boys dressing room. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? And he was just, he's just been a, a great guy. And then he wanted me, he asked me to take his picture, um, a new picture. He had always dyed his hair black, mm -hmm. but this time he was going to do the natural color. Like we, I will one day, but, and I took his picture for, for his show about six months ago. And then he asked me to take a picture for his new show. And he said, I'm doing something very, risque in a way I, I'm, I'm telling secrets and he's such a good storyteller and i was so mm. proud of him so proud of him well he's someone that i really admire uh leroy hopefully you'll see this later i'll send it to him i'll make sure that he sees it uh but i remember one night and i think i told you this uh him and bob came for dinner and it was him and bob and beth fowler and jack her husband and we sat down at seven o'clock for dinner and at one o'clock in the morning bob said i'm falling asleep uh because we just sat there for hours and hours and hours with these tales that he was regaling us with. And I mean, that, you know, my own show that's, you know, telling stories about people that I've worked with and life lessons that I've learned from all of these people. And so he is just a genius at what he does. Deborah, I saw you uh, a few years ago at Penguin Rep. Here you are uh, as Florence Foster Jenkins. You were so incredible. I've seen other people play this role but you are better than anyone that I've ever seen do it. And I've told you that before. Um, you have done uh, shows that are similar to almost, and your Unsinkable Women is also you on stage alone playing these incredible women. I'm going to show a few photographs in a moment. But have you ever done a show where you've just come out as Deborah Jean? Well, and so yeah, yes, I did, and I did it in honor of my my mother was a farmer's wife. She didn't have a lot of time to go to the theater, right? And she went to a country schoolhouse, and she never went above the eighth grade. And I decided to write a show called "Singing for the Cows," 
Ugh. And it's about it's about my family, his farm family. I mean, there are not a lot of shows really. That's you know, I went when I saw Shucked, or I haven't seen it yet, but I went. They really did something about corn. Nobody's interested in corn. Nobody. Okay, fine. But anyway, it was a historical piece about how my father's family got together with my mother's family and how our family came to be. So it's like a hundred. So it's me telling the story of my family, and I pay, I pay. Tw- I play 20 different characters. The good thing, the really wonderful thing about this, Thomas, was my mother was there and my mother passed away at the age of 98. God bless her. When I saw the show, when when I did the show back in Minnesota, there were people, some people came straight from the barn, you know, from milking the cows. That is amazing. They've never seen a show that was about them. I don't expect it to necessarily go to Broadway. I don't expect it to be, but it was a very important show. It still is. Um, I did it for the milk producers and, you know, maybe I can't drink as much milk as I used to. Maybe dairy products aren't great for everybody, but I grew up with people who, uh, it was about 4-H and, um, growing up in a Lutheran community, uh, I grew up as a Missouri Synod Lutheran, which is some people say it's misery Synod Lutheran. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am now in a Lutheran church that welcomes gay and lesbian parishioners. We have a um, LGBTQ shelter at the bottom of the church. Trinity Lutheran Church on 100th Street. I'm very proud to be at that church. And when they found out, when I found in Ron's papers that he baptized the Lutheran, his ashes are in the um, garden. And uh, it's very, it's, you know, like the theater is my home. And I've always had, I love storytelling. I love my family. And I do believe in prayer because sometimes mm-hmm. there's nothing else. There's nothing else. You have to keep looking up. And um, so, yes, I did a show and I still do it for when I ask um, singing for the cows. And I think it, when I was watching Leroy, I went, oh, I I could do that. Mm-hmm. Especially when he did his tribute to his. Um, sometimes the thing I, I found my, my friend Ron was the only son of an only son of an only son. And wow. he had one relative, one relative who's 79. She called me this afternoon to say, am I working? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. we have a little strike going on, but okay. Um, she's not, never saw her cousin perform ever. And he did 13 Broadway shows. But anyway, be, be that as it may, I, I thought there's a simpler way of doing it besides like a big show. It could be a cabaret show. And he was inspiring to me and what I really loved was his way of connecting to the audience. Uh, in, in the- hold on one second. Tom, Thomas, there's some weird feedback coming on on your phone. Uh, I don't know where that's coming from. Make sure you have no other windows open. Uh, anyway, um, it was inspirational in a lot of ways. And um, I think it showed it showed Leroy to be the kind of actor he is mm-hmm. without without playing a lot of characters. Like he 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 may have done a moment, you know, he never in pretended he was Carol Channing or he never be, you know and he never became different characters. He was always himself. That takes a lot of courage and I think it's it's definitely doable. Because when uh, you well, well it takes a lot of courage to get up there and to feel I think that we as we go through life uh, you know, one of the things when I do my on one-on-one interviews, I always ask everyone for a photograph of themselves at five years of age. And the reason I do that is because to me, that's the purest self before life begins to tell you who you should be or who you shouldn't be. And one of the most, you know, compelling, I don't want to give away too much of his show, but he tells this story in his show of when he got the draft papers yes. and that it was his mother uh, when the question was, you know, are you a homosexual or are you attracted to men? His mother said to him, say yes, because his father had served in the war, his brother had served in the war, but the, the, the honesty of his mom at that yeah. moment. And funny. we all go through a life and, you know, my show, I grew up, uh, right next door to a church. And the only property that separated my church 
uh, from our property was a cemetery. So I used to perform on our front porch, imagining that all the people that were in the cemetery were watching my show. You were doing an early hour town. <laughs> I was doing our town and I ended up doing our town years later. So, uh, but it was, I mean, it's interesting how, and you said something very interesting that jumped out for me a moment ago, Deborah. You said this, maybe this show won't go to Broadway, but everybody, Theater is not just Broadway. There's yes. so much theater that needs to be around the country. Uh, Thomas, I want to get back to you. Hopefully you are able to. Am I better? Uh, yes, so far. Okay. Than, okay. But Thomas, where did you first find your audiences when you were first starting out? Uh, when I was first starting out, honestly, like, am I better? Uh, it's still a little loud, so. I don't know if it's just... Well, just go with it. Go for okay. Um, my audience is, I, I would put on shows, we, my sister and I, we joke around all the time. We used to have a production company out run out of our basement called Downstairs Productions. So I, I performed for anyone and anyone who would listen, even or, you know, or wouldn't listen. Um, but, you know, we put on productions of Annie and High School Musical and Singing in the Rain and all of my favorite things at the time. Uh, and, you know, I think... Uh, community theater became such a huge part of my life too, which is why the center, I mean, is just, it's like a Mecca for everybody in that area who, who is wanting to be on stage and the quality and care they take with it. It goes back to that, you know, it's never going to be Broadway. It's never going to be top tier, but everyone, what, what I love so I much about it. Is, you disagree? Yes. I think it is top tier. I mean, you're well, your production of Dolly was absolutely top tier. Thank you. That means that means a lot to me. And I don't mean to put it down either. It's not, I'm not trying to say that it's it's not top tier. It's fantastic. But what goes into it is every everyone is is trying to do their best yes. work. And so it's creating, I mean, like that's how I grew up and I know all of these shows. I mean, what seven-year-old knows Kiss Me Kate or Oliver, you know, unless they are exposed to it. And that's what I loved so much about it. I would, I was as happy being, that's not true. I was almost as happy being in the audience as I was being on stage and watching these great, great shows. We owe a lot to MGM musicals. We owe a lot that we could watch these musicals on television in the privacy of our home and dance around in front of the television and imagine and go home and go, go to bed and dream. And I think that when you finally meet people that like to do the same thing that you do well then you know high school becomes rehearsing plays and college becomes i don't remember that class but but somebody you know i went to my college reunion and they said we remember you in that show and that show and that show because i was always at rehearsal and it just kept going that the 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 camaraderie and trust you have with people that you've been on stage with you know that if you get pushed uh, uh, you know, you might get pushed, but you they won't let you fall on your butt and crack your tailbone. Someone mm -hmm. will take care of you. And I've had that happen. And that's that's and Ron and I met on the national tour of Annie. And there are people on that national tour that I did 40 years ago with Harp Presnell that are still my friends. And when I, Catherine Buffalo is a very dear friend, she played the leading lady on uh, in Phantom of the Opera at one time. She was our little and she went on to do the Phantom. And we talk about once a week and she'll help me. She's like, oh, definitely put that in the press kit. Oh yeah, that's what you should do. And she's so, I know there's certain people that like Catherine Buffalo and Ron Schwinn and Michael Leeds. These are all people that I worked with. We toured for 18 months and I toured with Titanic for 21 months and they encouraged me uh, I was the swing for seven people and then I would I would go I, you know Eleanor Widener doesn't say a lot in the show but her life seems really important and so I gave these women more words I mean they, they're all gone now it's, it's next year will be 112 years since but I feel like I've made my life matter because of bringing them to life and there's Molly Brown and I got to meet Debbie Reynolds because Debbie Reynolds' daughter, Carrie Fisher, may she rest in peace, may they both rest in peace. Uh, Debbie chose Ron Schwinn to be Carrie Fisher's dance partner in Irene. 
and they were having an Irene reunion and, and both Carrie and Debbie were there. And it was like, I mean, I remember seeing that movie and I went like, if she can make it from the, you know, this nowhere town in, in Colorado and go to Europe, I could certainly make people laugh. Like I see on Ed Sullivan or something. I can do that. Uh-huh. I can make it from the cattle barn, you know, and it's, there was nobody else that there was no one in my family that did what I did. And there was no, we had, it, it was just a belief that, that it's possible. And she made it possible. And I was so thrilled to meet her. And I'm, you know, uh, she's a mega star. And then I got to do uh, Annie with Hart as now. And that's the place they came down in the movie. Oh, yeah. We danced together. And I went, oh my God, Harper. So I had to, you know, he had to almost slap me. He didn't exactly slap me. He went, yeah, I did, Molly. Oh. Like, get over it. You know, like, we got to work now. And we did. <laughs> And I'm still I, um, I interviewed Debbie the night before her final auction. You know, she fought oh, no. tirelessly for years to get all of her costumes. Uh, you know, they had warehouses and storage units uh, full of the, but she had to sell everything because it was just sitting there and she had lost so much money ac- accumulating all these items over the years. The night before uh, her auction, I interviewed her, and it was one of the saddest interviews I've ever oh. done in my life. Um, and uh, and she was crying, and I, I said, you know, we can do this another time. And she said, nope, I made a promise to you, and I really want to talk about this. And uh, and so we did the interview. The I have the audio of the interview, but that again was when I was writing my blogs. So the blog is there. Go and look up Richard Skipper, Debbie Reynolds. It's all there, everyone. Um, But I want to ask you, Deborah, and then I want to get to Thomas for a moment. Uh, You mentioned earlier these MGM movies, and uh, and I also, That's Entertainment came out in 1974, and that was a defining moment in my life in my hometown of South Carolina, in Conway, South Carolina. And as time went on, I, so many people that I saw on that screen, uh, became friends of mine, and uh, or I got to work with, um, and I believe also uh, in manifestation. I believe that I put it out there that that's what I wanted, and I got very very fortunate about that. You mentioned working with uh, Harv Pres- uh, Presnell and so many other people that you've worked with. I mean, going back to that little girl, could you have imagined that you'd be working with these people, or better yet? that they would be working with you? Well, I, you were talking about a picture of when you were young, and I have a picture. It's, it's, it's on the farm. There's a big field of corn, and there's a big tree, and I'm running to the camera like, <laughs> like that. And I was either running towards something or away something, but I was running. You know, I, I had a purpose. And uh, I remember uh, my father was sort of like children should be seen and not heard. We go to church on Sunday and book. But I had my uncle Otto and he said, I was I was trying to replicate something Lucille Ball had done on, on TV. I was trying to tell the joke, the physical joke like she did. But I was like nine or eight or nine. And uh, daddy said, be still. He, he was kind of. My uncle Otto said, oh, Henry, let her be. Let her be. She's funny. Let her be. And my father listened to him. And so he he went, I and he did always say to me, I don't understand what you do, but if you love what you do, that's what you should do. And I thanked him very much. And I remember he he took a life insurance policy out like parents do when they're born and they go like, Mm -hmm. and I said, well, Oh, he said, he said, this insurance policy has so much money in it now. It's. A, I said, what did you buy the life insurance policy for, Papa? And he said, well, that's so we can bury you if you died. I said, but I didn't die. I'm here. So what happens? <laughs> I get a prize? And he said, well, it's up to you. You can take that money and it's up to you or you can put it in for the future. You know, like, you mean for when I die eventually? I said, are you saying that I can have that money to do what I want with it? And he said, it's yours to decide. And I took that money and I learned to talk better. I, 
because I said, I think it's really interesting to say that I talk like this, but maybe that's not going to work all the time, okay? It's really interesting. So I learned to speak more neutral, and I studied mm -hmm. in England. And So I think the fact that my parents understood you have to, like, um, follow your bliss and do what you love. He said, I love cows. I'm not expecting you to love cows. And nobody said to me, make sure you give us some grandchildren. Make sure wow. you marry Nobody ever, they just said, make sure to get an education, make sure to do what you love, and mm -hmm. then everything else will come. And well, I've had a lot of love. Thomas, let me ask you, I mean, were your parents very in, uh, supportive of you wanting to go into the business? And whether they were or not, uh, who gave you the best advice when you were first starting out? Uh, my parents, both, you know, I, I, I have to give them credit. They, they brought me to and from dance classes, rehearsals. I remember my father saying when I turned 16, he was like, this is the best gift you could have given me because I was a, I was a busy kid. I was constantly, I was constantly going and to, for, to school, to work, to rehearsal. I mean, um, and so I give them a lot of credit for that. It was a little bit of a, you know, are we sure about this moment when I said that, uh, you know, this is this is what I want to do. This is what I, I really want to do. This, um, and I had just been so fascinated. I I became over like my time in high school. I would say, with all aspects of it. You know, I loved I loved the the directing aspect, the costumes, the the scenery, the scenery I wanted, I just, I loved being around it. So I knew it was going to be in my life no matter what. Um, but you asked about who's given me the, some of the best advice. And um, uh, I, I went to the neighborhood playhouse. That was kind of my college. It's a two year conservatory. Yes. Um, and uh, one of my uh, she came the year after I left, but I know Sandy and I am actually, her, her husband, Todd was one of my teachers, Todd Sussman. And he gave me amazing advice. And, you know, it, but when we get to, you know, when you're young and starting out, there's so, it feels like there's so much pressure, um, you know, and especially leaving school that second year. Um, and he gave me great advice for auditioning. And he just said, you know, anytime that you, you get there, you're not feeling your most confident, just crumple up the papers and say, you know, that's, <laughs> that's what you he know, said. It's, it's funny because I saw an interview recently, um, and th this interview uh, was with Leslie Jordan, who we lost too soon. But Leslie Jordan, when he arrived in Hollywood, uh, a short gay man, very effeminate, he said, I was a sissy. Everybody knew that I was a sissy. But it, it, it crippled him. It crippled him to the point where he didn't feel that he could be his authentic self. And so he started drinking and he had a oh. really bad drinking problem. He ended up in jail because of his drink, drinking and he was in jail for 120 days. Oh. And uh, while he was in jail, uh, he got a sponsor from AA. And the first thing the sponsor said is when you go to your first AA meeting, be as honest as you can possibly be with everyone in there. It's all about breaking those barriers. And he walked in and he said, I am a homosexual. And he said, and all of you, he said there were these big burly guys in there and they all were, um, you know, he said, you may not like me. You may not like me on site. You may want to bully me, everything, but I'm telling you, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. All those men were hugging him at the end of the evening. And they, uh -huh. and, but then he said he was going to an audition. He was auditioning for Ally McBeal. And it was his first big role that he got. And his sponsor said, when you go into the audition, go into the audition, not saying, I got to get this job. I got to get this job. But going in saying, how can I be of service to the people yeah. in this room? How can I give them what they are looking for? Because every casting person wants every person to walk through that door to be the one, the one that's going to go, wow, this is what I'm looking for. And I think we put this uh, thing on us. That, uh, I mean, it's like doing a show, doing, whether you're doing a one-person show or whatever. Those people who have bought those tickets are not going to spend whatever it costs to buy those tickets to watch you fail. They want to be there to support you. They want to be there to uh, 
And that's true of the way that we live our lives. If we go through a life thinking, how can I be of service to the people that I meet on a daily basis instead of, you know, everybody's out to get me, which is the craziness of the world we're living in right now, uh, it's going to be a different world. And we when have to... I, I had a teacher in graduate, I decided to go back to graduate school after I'd been performing professionally for 15 years. And I went, it's a good time to review. Let's just review. And one of the, one of my professors said, it's good to go in there saying, I am the answer to your casting problem. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. RuPaul says, um, you know, he goes, I, I know I'm purple. So if they're if they're looking to hire purple, I'm going to go in the room. I may not be the exact shade of purple, but the next time purple comes back up, they're going to say, you know what, that that nice light shade or this, you know, magenta, whatever it is. So it, it is about finding your place in. And it is the a, when, when I've auditioned for commercials, I remember one day when it was a Tide commercial, it was gray advertising and everybody there was was black. And I went, this is so cool because I'll have a black husband. And I, I said, and then my agent called me. I got a message on my service. She said, you didn't go on Tuesday, did you? That was African-American day. <laughs> went, oh. So that's the first time I realized, OK, like there'll be at that point in the world. Thomas. There were Caucasian people, there were Chinese, uh, Asian American people, there were black people, there were, but we didn't ever have like a black husband or uh, I wouldn't have had a wife. I mean, forget it. Now it's like, wow, a regular, like, oh, wow. There's so much diversity. I, I think that uh, the advertising uh, world is doing a better job than any other aspect of our business in terms of really showing, I really do believe that so? in terms of the diversity that we're seeing because I'm seeing interracial couples. Uh, I, I, you know. Primarily we roll along and there was like one of everything. And it's not pointed out. It's not done for the sake of, we have to cast someone of color in this role right. or we have to cast someone. I think it just is. And as you see these commercials now, um, you, it, it's so life affirming to me. One of my favorite commercials, I, I think it's a, a car commercial. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. The music that's playing underneath the song is playing what kind of music. And it's a gay couple, and they have adopted a pet sheep. And I know there are jokes out there, folks. Don't go there. Uh, but uh, they have uh, a pet uh, sheep. Uh, I don't know why my phone is ringing. Uh, hold, um, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to, I don't, I thought that I had turned this off. He did say pet sheep, didn't he? I did. He did say pet okay. sheep. <laughs> so, but what happened? I mean, what I love about this commercial, it says, don't follow the herd, you know, lead the pack. And uh, so uh, that is something that uh, yeah. I love. I want to have a little fun with both of you, and I want to talk about uh, your creative process and everything. But I want to, you know, I always do a, a thing on my Friday wrap-up show. I've got three mystery questions laid out. Deborah, I'll let you go first. So number one through three. I pick a one through three, I'll pick yes. a two. And your question is, which value do you care about that you're not currently living? Carefree. I'd like to think of value. A value. I, I think what I'm doing a lot is I'm I'm fretting a lot and I don't want to fret. So the value would be faith. I I have to have more faith in myself that it's kind of like you're good enough, you're smart enough, and gosh darn people like you. And yes. sometimes I literally have to say, put your big girl pants on and make a decision. It, this is not your first time at the rodeo. Uh -huh. I mean, you know which color to choose. You know you know what, you're gonna do your best. You always do your best. In fact, you usually do 125% Deborah Jean. So why don't you just 
settle for a hundred with this. You know, don't fret, have faith. So that's a value, value. faith is a value, I guess. It's absolutely a value, yes. Yeah. I would faith. think so. I need to have more faith. <laughs> that's a great answer. And Thomas, one or two? I'll do number one. And your question is, what do you regret not doing when you were younger? Oh, um, geez. Well, you know, uh, it's, I don't think that I regret this. I, I am very much a believer and not in the sense that everything will happen the way it's going to happen because you do have to put in the work. But um, I dropped out of school. I dropped out of college. I was going to go to SUNY New Paltz. And it was a four-year degree, and I got there, and it was just not, it was not working for me. I was also living at home, so at the time, I knew it wasn't where I, in the end, wanted to be. And it's not that I regret that decision, because that's what made me go, you know what, this is not for me, but I need to find something that is. So I went and I auditioned for the Neighborhood Playhouse and Stella Adler and all those other schools and um, AMDA. And I, you know, I got right back into, I had just finished all my college applications and I got right back into applying for things. But um, I say so often, uh, the first and only uh, visit I went on after that was the Neighborhood Playhouse. And uh, I knew I walked in and I saw Carol Channing's headshot um, she went to the neighborhood playhouse, and if you've ever been in their lobby, they have headshots of all the amazing alumni that have gone through there. And I saw her and Sherry Renee Scott, and I mean, there's a, a million alumni, Mary Steenburgen, and I just went, this is it. Like, if I, if I get in, this is it. And I think that put me at ease for my interview and my audition. Um, but I, I do regret, um, I think I could have stuck it out or finished off that four year, that four year program and then gone on to do something. I'm very glad that it all went the way it did. But, um, and I guess the only other thing I would say for regret is it took me a really long time to come out. And um, even at, I was away at school, I was living in New York City. I mean, what else is happening? And uh, it's so funny, people say, you know, we knew, we knew. But I, <laughs> I really didn't know, you know, I was so unsure of it. I, I can't walk say my world. Same thing. Same thing. I didn't know. And there's a lot. I grew up very Catholic. I went to Catholic school, preschool to 12th grade. And um, I'm very grateful for that education too. It definitely put me where I am and it definitely shaped my worldview. But it also allows me to put, I think, like compartmentalize and no. um, take a step back and see things I'll share with you. I just want you to know, uh, Thomas, uh, Lutheran is Catholic light. Yeah, you know, I, I sing at a lot of- um, And I used churches. to teach Sunday school with Everett Clinton. Does that name ring a bell to you? Yes, yes. You know he was I, don't know. I loved him so much. Such a good man. And he would often yeah. say to me, uh, it's all it's all about mercy, Jefferson. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I, I was very sad when he, he was always like, what are we going to, uh, what, what, you know, we'd get ready for Sunday school or whatever. And then the minister would come by and said, the important thing is to let them know that God loves them. And so we were teaching Sunday school after nine 11 and that was special. Mm -hmm. They were very little. And it was like, we did, you know, the black sheep and the, but I mean, we, so Everett and I did storytelling and then um, Marie Baker Lee was a dancer and, and, um, uh, Billy, um, Billy was an artist. So we had a pretty um, interesting group of people teaching Sunday school until there just weren't any people with children going to our church anymore. So I had to go to a new church because I kind of wanted to be, I wanted to be not the, not the youngest person in church, if you know what I mean. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Um, but I was going to say that I came to New York in 1979. Uh, New York was a very different New York from what it is now. Uh, when I arrived, I always, I, used to joke that I thought I was coming to the world to breakfast at Tiffany's and Sunday in New York. And I arrived in the middle of Midnight Cowboy and taxi. taxi driver. <laughs> and it was a very different world, but I was probably the most asexual kid to come out of the state of South Carolina. I did not know anything about my own sexuality or anything. And if I did, I've suppressed it to the point to where it was nothing. Um, but when I finally came to the realization of this is who I am, this is, you know, 
truly my authentic, authentic self, uh, just as I was making progress with accepting my own self, the AIDS crisis hit. Okay. And uh, to come out at that time was a very strange process because so many people that I knew and worked with and loved were dying around me. And there was so much that we didn't know about that time. So I do believe, because I'm a very spiritual person myself, I do believe there's proper timing in everything and that everybody has their own proper timing as to when it would come out. I wanna ask each of you a question. Today is uh, talk on an elevator day. And I'll start with you, Deborah. Are you one to talk on an elevator? Oh, oh yes. In fact, I once was paid to talk on an elevator by Tiffany and Company. And oh, really? Come, oh, yes. Well, a girl's got to eat, okay? <laughs> a girl's got to eat. It's better That's than right. working the streets, okay? I, I was an ambassador for Tiffany and Company, and um, my job would be to point people to the right things. And so I'd be in the elevator, and I'd say, I, well, I had my shtick more together, but it was like, diamonds, da-da-da-da, second floor. And like I would really do the low voice and like experience the romance, the elegance of diamonds. And then I, if that somebody would come in, I could see that they were like really in love because their eyes were like circling around. <laughs> and I said, so you're going to the diamond floor. Here, let me help you. And then I'd like, you know, like, this is a diamond floor person. And then they'd get their champagne and then they'd be coming down the stairs and they'd get a diamond about the size of your eyeball. That was kind of fun. I talk, sometimes I'm not paid to talk in elevators, but I will always say hello. And uh, if somebody's wearing something nice, I, I'll usually pick the oldest woman if there is a woman in the elevator and tell her how beautiful she looks. Because I realized that if you guys did it, he, she'd probably have to slap you or something. But uh, you know, I'm just saying that people, I could say things to a young lady or an older woman that maybe another man couldn't say and we don't, we've been locked up for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I think, well, you know, in a synagogue or a church, they pass the peace of the Lord. And I mean, some people are very lonely and they don't even get a hello. And they don't get that much intimacy in a little square booth. I mean, I don't hug and kiss them, but I do say hello. And I give them a compliment. <laughs> Have you seen the new Barbie movie? I'm going on my... I'm sorry. I have to bring it up. I have to no, bring I'm it up. I'm going on Monday too. I'm going to see it on Monday. I'm going to see it on Monday, and I've gotten a free ticket through the Entertainment Community Fund. So everyone I'm going with is of a certain age, and we've got a free ticket, and we're having a little lunch. And I'm going to dress. I'll dress in pink, although in I pink. never got a Barbie doll, and I thought they were kind of crazy, but we'll just see. I bring it up because there's a scene, and I think you'll you'll know it when you see it. I don't want to give anything away, but you know the. It's it's very well written. The movie is very well written and directed, and but there is a scene, and it, it just shows you how much something small like that, saying yeah. "Hi, you're beautiful, you look lovely today," that little compliment goes so far. And uh, yeah, it's I, I would say the same, Richard. Like I always I always say hello. I s try to smile. You know, now that we're out from behind our masks, it's like, my God, we should all be smiling at each I other. Know. We should all be grateful to be back in the world. I, honestly, I, I, had, I had COVID a, a week and two weeks ago for the first time. Wow. So I do, I'm still, I'm, I'm still masked, but I still talk. What can I say? Mm -hmm. Do either of you watch the show Blackish? No. There's a, there's a great episode of Blackish where they dealt with this, where uh, the father who is black, um, the elevator doors open and there is a little white girl on the elevator by herself. And of course, when the doors open, and we know why in the world that we unfortunately live in, that he decided not to get on the elevator alone with this little girl. And uh, they, and I saw this interview where he talked about that specific episode. Um, and to me, you know, I, I'm from a small town in South Carolina where everyone's, and I still, when I walk around where I live now, I'm saying hello to everybody. And when I go out, I say hello to, I strike up conversations when I go to the theater with the people that I'm sitting next to. Uh, and, uh, and it's so funny, my friends laugh at me because 
almost inevitably, every restaurant that we go to, we end up getting free desserts from the chef sent to our tables because I, I, I strike up conversations with the people that are working there. And, uh, and you know, and I, and I saw a posting today uh, that someone posted about uh, how we have gotten away from customer service and we are now going towards this world of AI, but we've been going in that direction for a long, 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 long time. I mean, uh, and this is something I'll share with everybody. Uh, when you go to the supermarket and you see the self checkout counters, pass them by and go to the people that are working there because if they are not working, they cut their hours. I don't uh -oh. know if you're all aware of that or not, but a friend of mine, her daughter is working her way through uh, uh, high school. And she said, Richard, tell everybody to get in her, the line where these young people are working because their bosses are looking to see if people are using the self checkout counters more so than not. And I think it's very important that if there's a real person that we deal with the real person and we treat them as a real person instead of just, you know, a face, this person who's working there. I think um, I, I happened to run into a psychologist in the park with his six month old baby and it was adorable. But he said the two areas of his thing was depression or whatever. And he said, there are two areas seven, eight, and nine-year-olds and older people. And he said the, the, the um, interaction with kids and because they had to learn to, they learned to read during the pandemic. So there was no weekly reader where they read aloud. And I happened to be with my cousins. They were visiting from Alaska and Colorado and they were young. And I asked them to read, give me your tired, your poor, your whole mess as long as mm -hmm. they read that. And I said, I'm going to re record it with my cell phone and I'm going to send it to your grandpa. And I realized that they wouldn't be able to do that in school because they've not been in school with other people. And that was a time when we oral interpretation, like how we read in front of other people. It gives you power. It's, you know, I didn't realize I, I uh, went upstate and I was living there full time during the pandemic and I started teaching at the Catholic school that I went to. Okay. Um, I was their general music teacher. So I had preschool through eighth graders. And um, of course, this was 2020, 2021, that school year. And we um, there was there wasn't going to be a musical. And I just thought that that was the most devastating thing. And I thought like that was the reason I was in school. That was the reason I was a good student. And so my partner, Nicole Tarza and I, we um, whipped up a Peter Pan Junior Spectacular that we did and we edited it all and we, we live stream, or we didn't really live stream it. We made like a little movie and um, oh, MTI Thomas, was so you're on the front lines. I love you. It was so great. And we did the same thing. We did Wizard of Oz and it was adorable. Uh, Richard and Deborah, I'll have to send you some pictures. Oh, I love this. I sent you the trailer, Richard, of what we did. And I mean, everyone's masked, but we did, you know, green screen and we would take each class was cohorted so they didn't get to interact with each other. The, the first graders were only ever seeing the first graders and the second graders were only ever seeing the second graders, the eighth graders. So we would, we, mix them all together and we did like we would green screen our wendy was in sixth grade and our peter pan was in eighth grade so we put them together in the same room so they could actually have a scene together i mean i'll be virtually did you do things like give something to somebody did you do clever things or you know they got something from somebody else we Hard. used every trick in the book. I mean, like we we really flew them. They, they we had them like laying on the ground on on a green screen and like kind of swimming with their arms and stuff. And we tried to like really. Um, we both grew up loving the Mary Martin version, so we we paid a lot of homage in in that sense to that. And it wasn't like on Zoom. It, it really was like a full a full on movie. And Good we had you. a cast of, you know, 40 lost boys that would, were never in the same room, but were all on screen together. And they saw that and it was like the best thing. That's amazing. I'm going to call you Dr. Netta from now on. <laughs> well, I am going to ask two more questions. The uh, I'm going to give you each one and then I'm going to give my final uh, comments. And then I'll turn it over to you, Thomas. And then Deborah, you will have the final word today. Uh, don't worry about how to end the show. When you say goodbye, the final credits will roll. Um, and your final word can be about anything that we spoke about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just any final message that you want to leave everyone with. Um, 
one thing that I do every day, I do my morning pages. Thank you, Julia Cameron. Uh, I begin my day from the artist's way. And uh, and I read a lot of books about creativity and uh, and uh, create, uh, creativity. And um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Deborah. And I'd like you to name three words or phrases that you wish to be known for. Enhancer. Dependable. Joyful. And you do all those with me already, so you're yeah. ahead of the game. And Thomas, uh, when people talk about you when you're not around, what do you hope that they're saying? Um, I hope they think I'm kind. That's my biggest, my biggest thing. I, I just, I, I want to like doctor, I, I guess Dr. Netter does fit, um, but do no harm. And if I can enhance, and I'm just dump, jumping off everything you said, Deborah, but if I can enhance or, or bring a little joy, I think that that is, that's, that's even better. But I hope they're saying I'm kind. I also love to be known as a hard worker, you know, even even when the going gets tough, um, that's that's one thing my parents gave me, both of them and my whole family. It could, we couldn't be more different. I'm the only one in showbiz. Um, but, you know, my dad was an iron worker. My mom was a banker. My sister's a civil engineer. My brother owns a landscaping business. And we are all extremely hardworking. So I know I got that from them. That's great. Uh, I thank you both for being here. And I want to thank everyone else. Uh, Pam, I see your comment. We saw both Sandy Duncan and Kathy Lee Crosby as Peter Pan. I also grew up, I grew up watching uh, Mary Martin. Um, and uh, it, I mean, just to see her uh, and that character and everything that it stands for. Um, when I first started doing this series, I got the good fortune of interviewing Sandy Duncan uh, and Don Korea. And after I interviewed Sandy, she said, I want to interview you because I want to know more about you, Richard. And I said, if you're serious, I would love for you to do it. And Sandy Duncan interviewed me. And it's on, it's available on my, uh, on demand on my channel. Sandy Duncan interviews Richard Skipper. Go and see it. It to me, the fact that, because I grew up watching Sandy Duncan on every television special, one of my very first auditions in New York, I am auditioning the Minskoff Rehearsal Studios, oh, and they were casting the kids for Peter Pan, and Sandy Duncan was there. And so years later, here I am with that moment. Um, as I'm thinking about my closing comments today, uh, Harry Collegian, who was Carol Channing's husband, there's a little poster I have back there. He always used to say, if kids are not exposed to the arts, they will not know the difference between a microphone and a xylophone. They just need to be exposed to it. That's all. Um, I have been very, very fortunate because I love doing talkbacks and I love uh, going to different schools. And in Western Connecticut, which is a very affluent community in Connecticut years ago, the high school was doing Hello Dolly. And so I went to talk to the kids. One of the things that I learned was that when the kids wanted to get uh, new seating for the auditorium for their theater department, they had to do bake sales, they had to do all of these different fundraisers and everything. When they wanted to get stadium seating for the football field, people threw money at them because people feel that the arts are something that can be easily thrown away. It has shaped Thomas and Deborah and my life, uh, and we're not alone. Every single person that is in the theater today, Leroy Reams the other night talked about his beginnings uh, and what that was like for him as a young uh, boy uh, growing up in uh, uh, Cincinnati uh, and just outside of Cincinnati. Um, every single small town in the country, uh, being in the theater, being in a theater program, being part of that builds community. It tells us how we have to work together for the common goal of what needs to happen. So theater is more than just what you see on Broadway. There are theater companies everywhere. Go 
go, go support live theater. Um, whether it be a cabaret show, a one-man show, or a bigger production, just go and do this. Um, I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice uh, for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list. I know that all of you are on Facebook. And uh, look at your friends list. And the sixth name that pops up, reach out today with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message. And if you don't have the phone number for that person, question why that person is a friend on your page. Because we need to really be in touch with each other uh, more so than social media. And a situation happened last night, and I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not blaming anyone. Uh, my husband, Danny, left work early, came home, and we went into the city to see a show. And when we got there, nobody was there. The show had been canceled on Monday, and I knew nothing about it because everyone felt that I would see it because it was posted on social media. And no one called, no one just to say, that show is not going to happen. Pick up the phone and call someone when there's this uh, important news. We also have reached the point where, and as I'm getting older, uh, it's like every other day, something pops up in my feed of someone who's lost a loved one, a pet, anything else. Let's please connect with each other on a regular basis. Uh, I have a dear friend. He says, we're all in the same storm, but we're in different size boats. And I always say, I don't care what size boat you're on, as long as you have a skipper by your side. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to leave. And Thomas, I'm turning it over to you. And when you finish, it's all yours, Deborah. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, this has been so, so wonderful, Deborah. It's been so amazing to meet you and talk to you. We'll have to stay in touch, I hope. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I guess if I, I'm left with thinking of a wonderful uh metaphor that a mentor of mine who passed away during the pandemic, uh, Kevin Archambault, uh, he was a wonderful director at the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck, but he's performed all over the place. And he's just, he was one of the kindest people I ever met, um, hardworking, just everything I ever inspired to be. And he used to say uh, at the end of every show that it was like you have built an elaborate sand castle and you've given it turrets and you put little you put little flags in it and you've maybe built a moat around it, but eventually the storm will come and it will wash that sand. It will wash the castle away, but the sand will remain. And for, and someday somebody else will come along and pick that sand castle back up and they'll create their own sand castle with the same sand that was a part of yours and the person before. And um, I, it just goes along with everything that Richard was saying about being a part of something and that theater really gives us that opportunity to be creative. And we never lose that, I don't think. I mean, what's what's so great on um, my time working with the kids, it's, you know, some not most of them will not go on to be performers or do anything in the arts professionally. But I look back and I'm thinking, my friends are the closest, the, the people that I did my high school shows with. They're some of my closest friends in the world. And um, it's because we, we built those sandcastles together and we got to play. And I just think that that's so important. So I'm going to echo everything Richard said. Get out there. Go see a, a show. There's things happening all over. Community theater is like, I feel it's thriving right now. Um, I, I saw a Broadway show last night. I, I, I wish I knew about Leroy's show. Deborah, I want to hear all about your stuff. I wish I could make it up to Cape Cod or Provincetown to see Richard. Um, but the art is out there. And I think it's it's for all of us to, to take in. So just thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This has just been so wonderful. I really appreciate it. Well, it's, I want to echo it. It's been great to meet you, Thomas. It, it made me feel like, you know, it's like a legacy. There's someone else that feels the same way about the theater and, and someone is bringing the younger people up too. I think it's great. Um, I had the privilege of having an aunt who was 108, a father who lived to 91, and a mother who lived to 98. And one of the things that my father said to me, he said, without singing, that he said singing kept him alive. And I think what whoever you are listening to the show, sing in the shower, sing a little bit every day. When your memory goes, you will still have the music. 
It's the one thing that doesn't go away. And that's why I love musical theater. Um, in musical theater, you've got, you, you float on an ocean of fabulous music and you have beautiful lyrics to interpret. I've loved doing Unsinkable Women. I hope to do it more. There's songs and stories there, but the most important thing is storytellers is the play. It's not our ego. It's not how many. Can we translate that story with songs and music? to the audience and it's like an electrical current. When that happens and everybody's listening and breathing at the same time, like when Leroy did his show the other night, we were all there with him at the same moment. That is magic. And that magic only happens in live theater. So I reiterate, go to the theater. It matters, it matters to your heart to your soul, to your cognitive abilities, and whistle a happy tune. <laughs>